Welcome to this UCL lunch hour lecture on our trade unions still relevant today. My name is Dave Wilkinson. I'm a principal research fellow at UCL Social Research Institute and a fellow at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, also known as NISA. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, Professor Alex Bryson speaking on this subject. I can't think of anyone better to talk to you about it. Alex is Professor of Quantitative Social Science at UCL's Social Research Institute. His research focuses on industrial relations and labor economics. He's also a research fellow at NISA and IZA. He's editor in chief on industrial relations, a journal of economic and society, and editor of the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series A and the Journal of Participation and Employer, Employee Ownership. Before we begin, I want to let you know that we have some time at the end of the lecture for questions, and these can be submitted at any point during the talk, going to the Slido um, on the internet browser, entering the event code, hashtag trade unions. I will now hand over to Alex. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, thanks for chairing this, and thanks everyone for inviting me. I'm going to talk about whether trades unions are still relevant today. So I'm going to start with telling you what, in theory, unions do. I'm going to ask the question, are they in decline? If so, does that mean they're no longer relevant? And I'm going to assess the evidence on that question. I'm going to show you that unions do lots of things and that they continue to do lots of things and that these things matter rather a lot for workers, for firms and for society as a whole. But I'm also going to argue that unions do face many challenges today, which means that they are continually having to reinvent themselves. So let's begin with what unions do. I'm gonna argue three or four things. Number one, they bargain. They bargain over terms and conditions. Who do they do this for? Well, for their members but not just their members, actually. Anybody uh, who's working in a workplace where a union has recognition rights for pay bargaining, and those workers are essentially covered by the union bargaining arrangements. The union uses what in the literature is called its monopoly bargaining power to push wages above rates that would otherwise be set by the marketplace. How do they do that? Well, they use that bargaining power essentially to threaten employers if they have to do so, sometimes through strike action, to push those wages above the market rates. For that to happen, unions require union membership. And the higher the percentage of workers in a particular workplace or firm or industry who are union members, in theory, the higher the bargaining power of the workers. What does this lead to? In theory, higher wages for union members or for those covered by union bargaining. Oftentimes fairer wages because unions try to compress the wage distribution and reduce discriminatory practices in the workplace. And this ordinarily leads to the reduction in wage inequality. Many non-union members can benefit from this activity on the part of unions. Why? Well, because that bargaining often means a change in the terms and conditions for all workers at a workplace, whether they are a union member or not. Essentially, this is unions providing what's called a public good, something that goes to everybody, whether they are a union member or not. And what's more, this can even have a spillover effect into non-union firms. How? Well, union bargaining can act as a threat to non-union employers. It can make them think hard about what they're going to pay their workers if they know they're competing with union employers for the same workers in the same labour market. This bargaining effect can have knock-on effects, some good, potentially some bad, and I'm going to come back to these, on issues that are really important for firms' competitiveness, productivity, profits, employment, capital innovation. 
So that's the first thing they do. What else do they do? They provide a voice for workers. They do so because they offer a mechanism whereby workers can actually engage in two-way communication with an employer. This is, I'd argue, essentially an extension of citizenship rights into the workplace. Imagine what happens in the absence of a union. It could be that workers simply have no opportunity at all to voice their concerns about problems they face at work. Although there are other voice mechanisms, and I've listed a couple of them here, direct voice would be things like town hall meetings, joint consultative committees, and under statute in some countries, things like works councils. Firms can actually benefit themselves from this worker voice. How so? Well, because in theory, if people can voice their concerns about problems that they have at work because there's a union, it means that those people with problems are less likely to quit the firm. They stay because they have voice and they think that problems can be solved accordingly. This leads to a reduction in labor turnover and thus incentives for firms to invest in things like training. Firms can also benefit from unions aggregation of all workers preferences about what should happen in the workplace. This is essentially quite an efficient form of workplace governance because in the absence of that, employers might have to go around asking individual workers what they think and what, think, what things should be done. The, at a policy level, the European Union believes that social dialogue, that's dialogue between employers and trades unions, can be beneficial in society. And I'm going to describe two examples of this here under what's called European social dialogue. This is communication between employers uh, and trade unions. The European Commission has argued in various uh, publications that this is a key to better governance of the enlarged European Union. It's a driving force for economic and social reform. And that unions are therefore a component in the de democratic government and also uh, economic and social modernization. The other thing that unions do is they provide insurance to workers. Insurance against what? Well, against employer arbitrary behaviors, things like discriminatory practices. So we find unions at the forefront in challenging these things, things like equal pay claims made in, in the law courts or trying to reclassify gig workers as self-employed towards employment such that they get employee-based rights at the workplace. And you'll often find it's trades unions who are representing workers in tribunals when they're facing things like unfair dismissal. Beyond the workplace, unions also have an important role. They are democratically run organizations promoting democratic solutions to political problems. We know about this from the Second World War. We know that trades unions have extended their remit into the political world through the setting up of political parties, such as the forerunner to the Labour Party in Britain in 1906. They lobby on behalf of workers' rights. That's why we have a national minimum wage in the UK, for example. And you'll have seen the original slide I put up at the beginning, women lobbying government for an Equal Pay Act, which came in in Britain in 1970, very largely at the behest of trade union lo lobbying. And they're engaged in tripartite structures, not only in the UK, but throughout the world, providing worker voice around the political table. This is hardwired in some countries, such as the Ghent countries, Netherlands, uh, Belgium, the north, the northwestern part of Europe, where unions are involved in the pension system and the provision of unemployment insurance. Fine, you say, but what's happening now? Are unions actually in decline and are they still relevant? Well, there are various metrics we can use to judge the health of trade unions. We can look at the proportion of workers whose pay is set by collective bargaining. That's bargaining between unions and employers. We can look at union density. That's the proportion of workers who are union members. We can look at the financial health of trades unions to see whether they are financially sustainable in the long run. 
and we can look at outcomes through union influence, the impact that unions have on outcomes that we all care about, wages, wage inequality, firm performance, innovation, worker well-being. So I'm going to show you in the next few slides that there has indeed been a decline in the incidence of unionization, both in Europe and elsewhere. And I'm gonna show you that in terms of union density, collective bargaining coverage, and the incidence of trades unions at the workplace level. But I'm also going to show you that this is not uniform. It varies very greatly across and even within countries. It varies across sectors and by occupation, and it even varies by birth cohort for reasons I'll come back to. In some places where unions still have a very important role, there are still questions about union legitimacy. A great example is the case of France, which I'm gonna come back to a little bit later. So this is the English speaking world. And this graph goes from 1970 through to um, about 10 years ago. And it shows on the y-axis union density. That's the percentage of workers who are union members. What do we see? First of all, we see it varies across countries, but we also see in all these English speaking countries, a gentle decline in union density. Um, in, in the UK, for example, you can see uh, it reached its peak just about the time that Margaret Thatcher came into power and has declined, declined quite substantially since then, although the rate of decline is petering out. Across the whole of the OECD, you can also see that decline uh, quite noticeably. But, and these are OECD figures, boy, does this picture look different apart, across different parts of the world. The top left chart here for the English speaking world is roughly the one I've just shown you. But now turn to the Nordic countries and these Ghent countries I've described, place countries like Belgium, you'll see very, very high and stable union density. Now, I mean, look at a country like Iceland, about 90% union density, and it's going nowhere. Um, but you can look at other countries and see substantial decline. And in some places it's low and static. So you can't generalize if you're sitting in the UK, Yes, you can see gentle decline in the proportion of workers who are union members, but it's not true always and everywhere. And you'd see quite substantial decline in other parts of the world, notably, notably parts of Eastern Europe. Look at the very long run, and this gives you another take on what's happening to trade unions. This is the union density rates across the whole of the OECD, going back to almost the beginning of modern trades unions in the late 19th century. What do you see? Well, you see persistent rise over time up until uh, the late 1970s, and you see some cyclicality with some big peaks, first big peak here, in and around the end of the First World War, second big peak, in and around the end of the Second World War. So don't don't think that we're in a, a period of secular linear decline. These things are somewhat cyclical and you can see that we are basically back down to union membership rates that we had in the mid 1960s. Let's look at another metric, collective bargaining coverage. This is arguably absolutely fundamental because this tells you the proportion of workers whose pay is set through trade union bargaining. What you can see here is a rather different picture. First of all, the proportion of people who are covered by collective bargaining is higher than union membership rates, for the reason I've already told you. Some people who are not union members happen to be in covered workplaces. But boy, does this matter. Look at the middle chart here for Nordic and Ghent countries, for example. You'll see countries like Belgium with nearly 100% union bargaining coverage. Look down here at France in the bottom left corner, nearly 100% collective bargaining coverage. Look at another country which I find particularly interesting, Germany. Here we see some decline. In the early 1980s, Germany was characterized by very strong sectoral level bargaining, industry level bargaining, but it's actually been in substantial decline in the last 20 or 30 years. So what do we draw from this? 
some serious stability at very high levels of collective bargaining in some really big and major economies. Elsewhere, we see low bargaining coverage, or we see changes in bargaining coverage in countries like Germany. So it's difficult to generalize across all countries. This is a summation of that. If we look at union membership rates, you'll see they're very high and fairly stable in Scandinavian countries. They're lower and falling in the UK. They've always been low in the United States and in continental Europe. And they're also fairly low, but bargaining coverage, on the other hand, this is the proportion of people whose pay is essentially set in conjunction with union bargaining. We're talking 70 or 80 percent of workers um, in, in continental Europe. Very different if you look at the United States and the United Kingdom. Let's go back to social dialogue and what happens in the European Union. The idea here is that the European Union believes it's really important that workers have a voice at workplace level. So that requires a union on site in workplaces. Does that exist? Well, here's information from the European Company Survey, which tells you it's very different across different parts of Europe. If you're in Spain or France, for example, or in Scandinavian countries here, we've got Sweden, Finland, Denmark, you, you, more than half of workplaces have employee representatives in place. But if we go somewhere like Greece or Portugal, very, very low. The UK, which actually the time that we did this study was in the European Union, somewhere in the middle. So it depends where you live as to whether or not you could access worker voice through trades unions. What's the nature of the challenge for trades unions today then, given this uh, picture of decline in some places, less uh, stability in others? Well, there's a problem, what in the literature is called a problem of collective action. Unions are providing public goods in the sense that although they are membership organisations, reliant in many instances on membership fees from members to keep them going, they're nevertheless providing bargaining type um, outcomes for workers, whether or not they're union members. It's very difficult to incentivize workers to actually join a union when they're already getting the benefits without being a member. We've known this forever. There's been a, there's a brilliant book on the problems of collective uh, action in the mid 1960s by Mankar Olson, who described the particular problems that trade unions faced in procuring these public goods and yet relying on membership in order to generate bargaining power. The problem, as he described it, is one of free riding, an individual's ability to get the benefits without paying for the fees. And you'd say, well, hasn't this always been a problem? And the answer to that is no. Why? Because a while ago, and in the UK, for example, up until 1990, the solution was something called the closed shop. That's the ability of an employer and a trades union in conjunction with one another to require any worker to be a trades union member. That is no longer enforceable under the law. Workers have a choice as to whether or not they like to join a union, and they'll often make that choice based on their perceptions of the costs and benefits of doing so. And so that's a really big challenge for trades unions. It's a particularly big problem because actually organizing workers and providing them with collective bargaining is actually quite a costly business. So it's really important for unions to, to be able to do that in a cost effective fashion and to do so in a productive way. But in fact, in some papers Paul Wilman and I have done, we argue that unions are cost disease organizations, which means it's very, very difficult to drive down the costliness of providing that membership good. What that means in practice is that over time, the costs of union membership rise relative to the other goods and services you have in your basket that you purchase every week. And that cost really matters as we've just shown in a paper I've done with Erling Bath. Uh, it actually affects the demand for unionization. How much you pay for it really, really matters just as other things might matter in terms of how much you're gonna pay for them, whether or not you purchase them. The state can play a big role here. Why? Because in many countries, 
union membership fees are actually tax deductible. And what we've shown in Norway is that as the, as the tax deduction for union membership has been rising in Norway as a function of state policy, so that's maintained union membership in that country. In other countries, there are real personal costs of union joining. This is well known in the United States where many employers are antagonistic to trade unions and engage in well-known unfair labor practices. But it's even true in a fairly substantially unionized country like France. So in a recent paper, uh, one labor economist has shown that if you become a union representative in a French workplace, this can damage your long-term career prospects. So I've already stated what the benefits, the theoretical benefits of union membership can be, wages and other benefits over and above what you get in the marketplace, the opportunity to voice your concerns and get solutions in the workplace, insurance against bad employer behavior. The problem, however, we argue in a number of papers is that union membership is an experience good. What does that mean? It means that you don't really know the value of it until you've tried it. And that good analogy would be, go see a film. How do we know whether going to the latest film at the cinema is going to be worth the entry fee? I rely on the reviews of others. The problem is, if there's been a decline in the proportion of people who have already purchasing union membership, I have fewer and fewer people over time to recommend that union membership. And this implies a reduction in entry to trade unionism amongst young workers, which should show up in cohort effects. And it does, and I'm just about to show you that. There are a couple of other threats that unions may face. One is competition from the state and from employers. How so, you might ask? Well, it could be that employers make up their own voice mechanisms. Maybe the town hall meetings substitute for union-based voice. And maybe at the state level, if they're providing rights to workers through statute, through legislation, perhaps we don't need trade unions anymore. That's theoretically possible. Is it empirically the case? Let's look at union membership by birth cohort. And what we see here um, is that along the bottom here, you can see the age of workers. And uh, across the y-axis, uh, y you can see the percentage of those workers who are joining a trades union. It peaks in people's middle age when they're in the, about their 40s or 50s. The critical thing about this chart is look what happens to the wiggly lines. The wiggly lines are going down the more recent the line is. So if you take a particular period, let's take uh, if you're a 26 year old, if you were born in the early 1970s, your membership rate as a 26 year old was 22%. If you were born in the mid 1980s, that had already fallen to about 17%. What this is showing is that uh, across cohorts for any given age, the union membership rate is falling. So that's a very serious problem. It's telling us that unions are finding it difficult to recruit and retain new workers. What are the potential reasons? Well, there's a lot of chat about this. People often say things like unions have had their day, they are a collective problem solving uh, approach in a world which is increasingly characterized by individualism. They might say there's more competition from the state and from employers, as I've just described. Well, what's the evidence? The cohort effects I've just shown you are suggestive of a decline, perhaps even in the desire for union membership, but that's not true. What, we, what we've seen, uh, more direct evidence, which asks workers whether or not they want to join trade unions and belong to trade unions, it's actually indicative of a representation gap. The demand for union membership is actually exceeding the supply, the opportunities to become a union member. And the work that I've done with colleagues in Canada and the United States, where we look over time at the desire for union membership amongst young people, it hasn't changed over time. 
Furthermore, there's no evidence of substitution for union voice by other forms of voice. The demand persists. The problem that people have at work, the problems that they have, uh, which unions are supposed to solve, persist. And people still see unions as a solution in a paper I did with Richard Freeman a few years ago. But unions are essentially businesses. They offer goods and services to members. But in some countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, they are wholly reliant on union dues to balance their books. Oftentimes they're engaged in competition between one, one another for union members. And they're facing increasing costs in providing those goods and services. And furthermore, the marginal costs of providing those goods and services are also rising. A great example would be the decline in the average size of a workplace. It's a great world to live in if you're a union organizer and you've got big factories, um, big coal pits to organize, and you can get all the workers in those large factories and coal pits to organize. But in a world where those big, big factories have declined and we've got more and more small workplaces and in the extreme scenario, we've got the whole gig economy, these are very difficult and costly people to organize and to hold on to. This means that unions have to think hard about the circumstances in which they'll actually organize workers and provide them with the union good. It's not true in some other countries where those unions are hardwired into the welfare state. They are less reliant on union membership dues. I've talked about these Ghent countries in the northwest of Europe. They are providing unemployment insurance, they're providing pensions, they are part of the social democratic institutional infrastructure, and this can help explain their resilience. However, of course, it's very hard to transfer that sort of scenario to the Anglo speaking world where that simply doesn't happen. So bottom line is the fortunes of unions differ quite dramatically across countries. If we think of the UK and the US, those unions are fragmented. Often the, work, the organizing and the bargaining takes place at workplace level, plant by plant, really hard to achieve, especially in the United States where the law makes it hard uh, and costly for them to organize. What uh, one of my colleagues once called getting through the eye of a needle. So it's a high bar to entry, which is why you see very low unionization rates in the United States. Um, in the US and the UK, they are membership clubs. They require, these, they require these fees. So if union density is falling, that's really bad news for unions. But look at France. France is a really different world. France has much lower union membership than the UK. You might not think that when you watch your television and see them out on the streets. But that's because unionization is somewhat different in that country. Number one, 90% of workers in France have their pay set through bargaining with employers. And it's actually, because of the law, very easy to trigger workplace representation for unions in France, even in the absence of union members. There are some issues about that, around the credibility and legit legitimacy of union representation when they have very low union membership. And this is currently being addressed through legislation that's been ongoing in the last five or 10 years in France. The other thing about France is political traditions really matter. You get some hardcore communist, uh, socialist unions. You also get Christian democratic unions. And they're very different one from another. They all have their own constituencies and their own bases, and they, they operate very, very differently in many ways uh, to the membership-based unionization that we have in Britain. In Italy, again, just to give one more example, the majority of union members are actually retirees. They're not even in the workplace. The reason is the, the uh, Italian unions play an important role in the, pen, in, in the pension schemes there. Another question we have to ask ourselves is, has employer demand 
for unions change. You think, hold on, employer demand for unions, surely employers don't want uh, unions. Well, actually, they do in many instances. Unions often operate as agents for employers. How so? Well, voice, union voice can help in long term contracting with workers. If you want your workers to stay, you want to help solve their problems in the workplace in order to avoid them from quitting. And a union can help in that regard. A union can also provide information to an employer. For example, workers on the shop floor know a lot about the production process and how to improve it. And they may transmit that tacit knowledge to their supervisors and managers through a trades union in return for something which might be better terms and conditions. And they also aggregate worker preferences in a very efficient fashion. So the employer knows what the workers are thinking. Why? Because the union can help the employer understand that. Even bargaining is useful for employers. It can take wages out of competition, which means they can compete on other margins. And unions help employers comply with the law, protecting them against legal liabilities. Of course, the problem is that if union membership is declining, unions' representativeness in terms of their worker base is falling, how reliable are they as a voice to the employer? Maybe employers might shift towards producing alternative voice mechanisms. And maybe some employers are beginning to choose to compete on wages. They, they face global competition, and they're looking for opportunities to lower wages. This may limit the power of unions going forward. What do we find in terms of evidence? Well, actually in Britain and Germany, we see a substantial demise in sectoral bargaining. Very substantial. Employers voting with their feet by leaving industry-based bargaining. It's still poorly understood, but it's important that we try to understand that. Instead, employer collectives, employer associations and trade associations, they're continuing to play an important role in the labor market, but they're often focusing on other activities, which we've talked about in a recent paper, including collusion to reduce labor market competition. Employers are also increasing their investments in different forms, which could potentially substitute for trade unionism. Let's look then at the effects of trade unions today. What you'll often see in the, in the literature and in political discourse is there was a time when trade unions mattered. They affected wages, inflation, strikes, productivity, politics, but now they're in decline. So maybe they don't matter. And there's a tendency to write them off politically, economically, even academically. This is a big mistake. They continue to do all sorts of things in the economy and in society in general. Many unions remain very strong, but even when there's union decline, this also has important economic and social consequences. We actually need empirical evidence to understand this. Why? Because in theory, the effects of unions on things like firm performance are actually uncertain a priori. Oftentimes it's assumed that the bargaining effect can impact negatively um, firm profitability, whereas the voice effect can be beneficial to firms. And so these offsetting theoretical things need to be studied empirically to see what actually happens in a unionized world versus a counterfactual non-unionized world. So we have to study them. And what do we find? We find quite a lot of change actually over the last 20, 30 years. We find union effects on inequality, on fairness at work, enforcing worker rights. Unions have pretty good records in dealing with inequality, dealing with unfairness and dis discrimination and enforcing worker rights. In terms of social welfare, there are mixed results about unions in terms of their impact on worker well-being. But more recent and what I'd call better studies are tending to find positive well-being effects now. Remember, of course, don't generalize. Unions are very different one from another, as I've emphasized in this lecture, both within and across countries, and that's often ignored by commentators and academics. 
What do we know about wages? Well, unions continue to bargain such that their members and covered workers continue to see a premium relative to uh, non-union workers. Uh, in papers that we've done, we often find this is about a 5 or 10% uh, difference, certainly in the UK and the United States, although it does differ across countries, we still find it everywhere. They also continue to compress wages. They've done this uh, in the past. So a recent paper by Hank Farber for the United States, but actually what they do depends on where the unionized workers are in the wage distribution, the size of the union premium. Um, but the bottom line is that in most instances, we find that unions continue to compress wages relative to a scenario in which unions are absent. Um, but uh, it's very important to notice that with the decline of trade unions, that impact is falling away. So my colleague at UCL, Christian Dussman, has done just this for Germany and finds that the demise of sectoral bargaining in Germany plays quite an important role in increasing um, um, wage inequality. And Nicole Fortin has just done a paper for the United States showing that the decline in unionization over there reduces the threat effect on the non-union sector which means that those non-union workplaces no longer feel the unions breathing down their, down their necks in terms of competing to workers. That means that they're unlikely to raise their wages up close to the union sector because that union sector is diminishing in size over time. There are other things that uh, unions are doing. Let's take democracy. We've just done a paper recently for the European, with the European Social Survey, which shows that if you're a union member, you're more likely to vote in democratic elections. So there is continued um, evidence that they promote democratic behavior. What's been happening on unions and worker well-being? Well, in the old literature, unions were actually uh, implicated in increasing job dissatisfaction. You'd think, well, that's rather odd if they're improving terms and conditions. It's actually a function of their voice effect. That is to say, if I'm a dissatisfied worker, but I have a union available, I'm more likely to stay in that workplace rather than quit and go elsewhere. In more recent times, we've got new evidence that it's since the Great Recession, there's an increase positive correlation between unionization and worker well-being. We've also got recent evidence that unions reduce it, reduce ethnic wage gaps. How do they do this? Partly through bargaining, but also through the promotion of job evaluation schemes. And there's clear hard evidence that unions continue to promote gender equality, not only in the workplace, but through class actions in the courts to enforce equal pay legislation. Employers are actually benefiting from trade unions as well. How so? Well, in terms of innovation. In the past, there was lots of evidence to suggest uh, that unions were a problem, holding up capital innovation. That's no longer true. We've got evidence for Norway and Britain that that's no longer true. Unions are positively associated with product and process innovation. They improve the, the probability of organizational change in the workplace. Why? Well, here unions play a role in reducing the job related anxiety that workers feel when facing change. And they're also implicated in improving the likelihood of firms using high performance workplace practices. This very much contrasts to the old days when David Metcalf in the late 19. 80s was describing the role of trades unions in enforcing restrictive practices in the workplace. There are disparate results on unions productivity and profitability. Um, so there's a great meta analysis by Dukugliagos and La Roche about this, which I recommend. Um, but many of the negative union effects are in the early literature and there are more positive effects more recently. And in fact, in the paper we've just published in the Economic Journal, we show that these effects in the Norwegian case anyway, are actually causal. Unions are improving profitability for Norwegian firms. And this is consistent with an old proposition from uh, uh, a German sociologist, Wolfgang Street, that unions are a beneficial constraint on employers. 
It's not great giving employers free reign to manage in the workplace. Unions come in and make them think twice about the decisions that they're making. And this can be to the benefit of both the firm and the workers. So union effects do seem to persist, notwithstanding the decline in their incidence in many countries. This is not that surprising. Unions continue to target high profit sectors and high profit firms to organize them rather than firms that don't have much to offer in terms of bargaining. They organize professions with high bargaining power, such as health professionals. Um, so yeah, there's lots for them to do. And the degree to which competition is squeezing out opportunities for unions to organize, I think is largely exaggerated. So finally, the implications for policy and the future before I hand you back to Dave. Are unions welfare enhancing seems a really big question to me. One question we need to ask, which we don't have a full answer for, is where do these wage gains come from? If union workers do get more than they get in the market pace, is this good or bad for everybody else? Well, it partly depends on where those wages are coming from. Maybe unions are operating in a way that's forcing employers to pay what they should be paying in terms of their marginal productivity. That would be consistent with a world in which, for example, unions are challenging uh, gender wage discrimination, for example. It could be that um, unions are improving the productivity of workplaces and as a consequence can get better wages. It could, on the other hand, be they're not doing that. They're simply forcing employers to hand over a portion of their normal profits. If that were the case, that would imply ultimately at the extensive margin, more plant closures and more firm closure in a unionized environment. That just doesn't exist in the literature. Another question of course, is what's an optimal level of inequality? A really, really hard question to answer. If we think unions reduce inequality, is that a good or a bad thing? On the whole, many of us might think of it as a good thing, but sometimes a degree of inequality could be useful, for example, in terms of creating incentives for workers. And there could be positive spillovers to workers in general. In the old days in countries like the UK, we did have statute which allowed for the extension of collectively bargained terms and conditions. In the UK, they've largely gone. In other countries, they continue, which is why you see such high levels collective bargaining coverage. The union threat effect might be useful for workers in the non-union sector because their employers are cognizant of what's happening in the union sector and are looking to match their terms and conditions. And unions are still providing some degree of pressure for legislative change in areas like work-life balance. So in the future, it could be that unions need to think hard about obtaining what well, their role is in uh, obtaining mutual gains for workers and employers, how to be a beneficial constraint on the employer. There's concern about employer actions in terms of dem the demise of sectoral bargaining. Great example here I want to give is Volkswagen, German-based company manufacturing cars. Are they organized and unionized in Germany? Yes, they are. But why is it then that there's a huge Volkswagen plant in the southern United States in Chattanooga, which is non-union. Well, most of the southern United States is non-union. There are reasons why employers go there and they change their tactics according to where they are. A big concern for unions is a race to the bottom in terms of looking for the least costly place to produce goods and services, raising questions about whether unions can su survive and prosper in those settings. So it raises a question at the bottom here about whether we, unions will look different in the future. Well, maybe they should do. In the UK, for example, are they democratic, open and transparent? Or as some people say, male, pale and stale? Well, they're not as male as they used to be. First of all, um, most of the union members in Britain now are women. They constitute over half of all the membership in the UK. And this is now, reflected in the leadership in the top trades unions, Unite, Unison, RCN, 
all run by female general secretaries. So there's change going on there. We also know from surveys, and this is, I think, the European Social Survey, that trust in unions in Europe has been rising. Trust in many other institutions is, is falling, but not in terms of trade unions. But they probably are going to look different. There are some successful unions. Most of them are occupational, teachers, doctors, nurses, often in public sector. They have a clear identity. They're hardwired into an occupational infrastructure. But there are new unions on the rise as well. The Baker's Union is really organizing fast food chains in a way I've never seen before. And in places like the U UCL, we see the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain uh, organizing uh, gig workers, and they're organizing workers in, in, uh, in things like Deliveroo and so on, and doing an unbelievable job uh, in doing so, using new technologies to reduce the cost of servicing those workers and reducing the marginal cost of organizing those workers. And so that's what unions are going to be doing in the future, using new technologies and new ways of organizing to lower the costs of getting the union voice out there. That's what they're going to have to do if they get to be to, to remain relevant to, to workers who are often marginal in the labor market. They're going to be using these new modern communication technologies to build new worker voice platforms. Will it happen? I think it will do. Um, I think they're going to learn from business models, places like Uber and Airbnb disrupting traditional business models. And I think they'll do exactly the same thing in the union space to make sure that they can bridge that gap that I described, that frustrated demand for worker representation in the workplace, where there's a gap between the proportion of people who are actually unionized and the proportion who want it. OK, I'll stop there. Back to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Alex. That was fascinating, covered a lot of material, um, really useful lecture. Um, we have a bit of time for questions. So if you've got questions, please type them into the, the Slido. We've got a few. Um, so the first one I kick off with is um, given the situation we're in, where there has been consistent below inflation wage growth, does that not suggest unions have been less useful for a while? Um, not really. I mean, there's there's a couple of big things going on. It's true that there's been, for many years, substantial wage stagnation, especially in the public sector, where unions' ability to make a difference uh, has been somewhat undermined by the advent of pay review bodies, which have replaced collective bargaining. Lots of the concerns about uh, real wage decline are, are amongst those public sector workers. In the private sector, there's still, and even now, fairly healthy uh, real wage growth among uh, large numbers of workers. Uh, at the same time, unions have actually done rather a lot to maintain employment levels amongst uh, in the union sector, especially in the face of COVID. They were heavily involved in the in, in, in the furlough schemes and how they were designed and so on. Uh, and they've played quite an important role, I think, in maintaining hours of work, not just employment at the extensive margin, but the number of hours that you're actually employed in your job. So all these things are quite important. Um, unions can't do everything, uh, but I, I do think they continue to play a really important role in, in, in a challenging world. But I do think that's somewhat circumscribed in the public sector. Great, thanks. Kind of following on a little bit from that, um, obviously we're in a period where there's quite a lot of strike activity. Um, I guess, would you say that's a representation of strength or weakness of unions? You could argue, I guess, Strengths, because it seems very strongly supported by members and weakness that it hasn't really been resolved yet. So what would you uh, say? I think you, you, you've you answered the question yourself, Dave. I tend to agree with you. No union representative or leader ever wants to go into strike action. It's costly. It's risky. It's potentially damaging, especially if it persists for a long time, the public could turn against you. It may not even translate into a better bargained outcome. 
on the other hand, needs must on occasion. And if an employer is not budging or is not, or is not bargaining in good faith, and there are no opportunities to go to arbitration or seek third party involvement, such as ACAS, it seems reasonable that trade unions might ballot their members. And of course, in doing so, they can simply balloting and getting a yes for strike action or action short of a strike can increase their bargaining power and they can return to the bargaining table. If an employer continues to hold out, strikes may ensue. And it's uncertain a priori whether success will follow. There can be success. It can actually generate demand for increased union membership in many cases. And in some instances can lead to a settlement that might not otherwise have been possible. Thanks. A couple of related ones, I suppose. One, um, can you see more young people today and in the near future joining unions compared to other generations? And kind of in relation to that, you've shown us that union membership is lowest among young people. So mm. how should unions kind of market themselves to young people? Yeah, so it is true. And go back to that cohort chart I was showing you, it's true across all cohorts that union membership is declining at every age. But it is also clear that unions are finding it harder to organize new workplaces and new workers. The reason that it's hard to organize the new workers is because, as I've said, I've characterized it as uh, an experienced good. They normally rely on others, parents, family members, peer group members, to tell them about the value of union membership. And if those guys are less likely to be union members than they were in the old day, they don't get accurate reports about the benefits. What do you do in that situation? I've always argued with the trade unions that they should go route one. And route one is to get really well-known people who've been union members as young people and get them on television in adverts explaining the value of union membership. My favorite one has always been uh, David Beckham. He would have been a member of the um, Football Players uh, Association. And don't get him to talk about himself because people might not relate directly to somebody as high and mighty as D David Beckham, but they'll listen to him talking about his colleagues who were also at Man United with him when he was 16 or 17, who didn't make it. Maybe they got an injury. Maybe the union helped out when that person hit the buffers and hit hard times. That's a way to sell the union good to new generations of young people where they'll learn about the benefits. The other thing that's happening, strangely enough, is it's happening on the ground. I mentioned the Baker's Union. They all, they've been organizing in uh, chains like McDonald's, which traditionally have been incredibly hard to organize. Young workers, high labor turnover. But in some parts of the country now, there are very few other jobs to go for. And people see these jobs a bit more as a bit more career oriented than they used to be. And those unions are changing their techniques. They now explain to workers how you can engage in flash strike action for an hour, two hours during a working day, totally disrupts production in a food retail outlet and forces the employer to think much harder about engaging with people who previously thought they had no bargaining power. So this is changing. I mean, presumably this is also made more difficult through the gig economy and more fragmented employment. All these things are, are making life difficult to organise. Of course. And I, to be honest, Dave, I, I thought of that as a very serious threat to trades unions 
but over the last couple of slides I showed, I skipped over a lot of it because I was running out of time, but tried to intimate how unions have innovated in this space using new technology platforms and new tools, both to reach out to workers often don't even have a workplace. They're out on the road on a bike. But unions are reaching out through phones and different mobile facilities and are organizing key actions in order to galvanize workers. And the great one in the gig economy is forcing employers to recognize that they have employment responsibilities as employers. These workers are not self-employed. They're operating under the direction of an employer, often with facilities that are given by the employer. And so this is not self-employment. The unions are fighting these actions often very successfully in the law courts. And gig workers have seen the value of unionization as a consequence. Yeah. So a very specific one. Have you or others studied time trends in the representation of unions in the media, e.g. in newspapers reporting of strikes? You know anything? <laughs> no, but I do know of people who look, have used newspaper um, reports as a way of trying to understand changes in unionization over time. A great example is uh, my old mate Richard Murphy, who was at the Center for Economic Performance, who's now at Texas Austin, who looked at the role of newspaper reports about teachers facing various forms of disciplinary action and the impact that it had on union membership rates. Essentially, what happens is when people get into trouble and difficulty, they resort to a union, they join the union, and that's the insurance component of the union good that I referred to earlier. So I've seen newspaper reports used in that way. And I've also seen some people look at the portrayal of trade unions over time through the media. Paolo Santini, who's recently gone to Copenhagen Business School, he's done work on that. But yeah, that's about all I know on that issue. So we've got a couple more just to round off and they're kind of general ones. So it's kind of a nice place to finish, I think. So um, does union success ultimately rely on pro-union politicians being elected? Um, no, because um, unions are independent entities. And in fact, under the law, they need to be independent of both politicians and employers. But union friendly policymakers can really, really help trade unions, especially in terms of reducing the costliness of organizing workers who want to organize and limiting the problems that unions face in providing their union goods, critically around the sequestration of funds when they fall foul of liabilities under the law. These, this has become more and more problematic for trade unions under to, over time. And I think um, policy people could do something about that. If I was going to say number one thing they should seriously think about is the way that trade union membership is subsidised through the tax system. That could really help. We've seen that in Norway. I mentioned that work. They could do that in this country. And I want a 30 second answer to what do you think would be the impact of a world without trade unions if they did die out? I mean, that's been what you've talked about for the last hour, but give us a 30 second answer to that. Well, I think the answer to that is the problems at the workplace would remain and something else would have to come in its stead whether you called it an independent trades union or not, some form of uh, voice mechanism would appear because there would be a requirement for it on the part of workers. Yeah, it sounds sensible. I think that's a good place to end. So thank you everyone for joining the lecture. I hope you found it informative and interesting. Um, huge thank you to Alex. For, for the lecture, it's been really interesting to listen to. Um, just to promote the lecture next week on the 15th of June about novel ways to treat the brain with gene therapy, slightly different topic with Dr. Gabrielle Lignani. So hopefully you'll join us next week. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.